Good evening. You're watching The Big Story with Harry Anto Deman. I'm Olivia Quay. Subscribe to The Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. There was quite a stir this morning at Tiong Bahru Market when members of the Progress Singapore Party were there for a breakfast meeting. Mr Lee Sen Yang, the estranged brother of Prime Minister Lee Sen Lung, had arrived with the group and was presented with a party membership card by Dr Tan Cheng Bok. Now here's the multimedia journalist Kimberly Zhao with more on how Mr Lee will be involved in PSP's election plans. I'm here at Tiong Bahru Market where earlier today Lee Sien Yang was officially announced to be a member of the Progress Singapore Party. When asked what his contributions would be, financially or otherwise, Mr Lee said that all will be known in due time. I will contribute in many ways and in my contest I'm sure you'll find out. He's not just an ordinary person. His father is the founder of Singapore, you know. So that's very important. And the fact that he has decided to join us is a clear indication that something didn't, many, maybe the, the, the current team didn't follow what his dad wanted. Parliament was dissolved on Tuesday and the writ of election issued, with nomination day slated to be next Tuesday on June 30th and polling day on July 10th. Tiong Bahru Market is located within Tanjong Paga GRC, the former stronghold of Mr Lee's late father, Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew. It is also one of the nine constituencies the PSP will be contesting in this election. Meanwhile, the People's Action Party introduced eight new faces today. This was done in two separate press conferences held at the party's new Upper Changi Road headquarters. Multimedia journalist Dylan Ang has more. Deputy Prime Minister Heng Sui Kiet who is the People's Actions Party's first Assistant Secretary General, introduced the party's first slate of new candidates at PAP's headquarters this morning. We have an ongoing process of uh, renewal of our candidates for the election. And this will allow us to bring in more uh, new faces from different segments of our society so that they can uh, represent different segments of society, they can bring different interests for discussion. And I'm very glad that uh, this time uh, we have a very interesting and diverse slate of candidates. Mr Heng introduced four new faces, while Environment and Water Resources Minister Masago Zukifli introduced another four in a separate press conference. Here's a brief look at the eight new PAP candidates. Mr Desmond Tan left his post at the People's Association earlier this month. Prior to that, he was a Brigadier General in the Singapore Armed Forces. He joined politics to do his part in preserving social mobility and shape a society that the public wants. Mr Edward Chia is the co-founder and managing director of lifestyle company Timber Group. He hopes to be an effective voice for small and medium-sized enterprises in Parliament. Ms. Nadia Ahmad Samdin is an Associate Director at TSMP Law Corporation. Having volunteered at various organisations since she was 15, Ms. Nadia said she hopes to be a voice for her generation. Mr. Ivan Lim started work at the age of 16 at Keppel Shipyard and was later awarded a scholarship. He is currently the General Manager at Keppel Offshore and Marine. He is concerned about elderly residents and children who require social assistance. Ms. Henny So, a director at MSC Law Corporation, said she began volunteering to share her past experience, having come from the normal academic stream and her legal knowledge. She hopes to continue to do so to help others. Mr. Mohammad Fami Aliman is the director at NTUC Administration and Research Unit. He was previously a colonel in the SAF and Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the Islamic Religious Council of Singapore. He said he wants to be the voice of low-wage workers. Mr Don Wee works at United Overseas Bank. He said that he hopes to be able to help small and medium-sized enterprises by proposing improvements to assistance schemes. And finally, Yip Hong Wing is the former Group Chief of the Silver Generation Office under the Agency for Integrated Care. Having interacted with many senior citizens during his time with the office, 
he said he hopes to make Singapore the best place for seniors to live and be productive in. The PAP will be unveiling more new faces in the coming days. Singaporeans will be able to watch all political candidates speak during prime time on TV in a series of special constituency political broadcasts. These broadcasts will run from July 3rd to 7th, starting from 7pm on Channel 5. The two-party political broadcasts will also be aired on July 2nd and July 9th, which is cooling off day. They will be aired across 19 TV and radio channels from 7pm onwards. These party political broadcasts are among the exceptions to the prohibition of campaign activities on the day. The Reform Party announced that it will no longer contest West Coast GRC, paving the way for a head-to-head -head fight between the People's Action Party and the Progress Singapore Party. RP Secretary General Kenneth J. R. Rednam said that his party has withdrawn from contesting the area after long talks with PSP's chief Tan Cheng Bok. The PAP defeated RP in West Coast in 2015 and 2011 and has won every election there since the constituency was formed in 1997. Meanwhile, the Workers' Party released a video introducing 12 candidates that it's likely to fill. It follows a teaser clip that the party uploaded on social media last night. This new six-minute long video includes familiar faces like Sylvia Lim and Pritam Singh. Among the new faces are social activist Raisa Khan and advertising executive Nicole Sia, who was a National Solidarity Party candidate in the 2011 GE. Former w WP Chief Lau Tia Kiang, who is recovering since a fall in April, was also featured, but he did not speak. The People's Voice Party announced they will contest Pungo West SMC and Pasiris Pungo GRC, where a three-way fight may take place with the PAP and Singapore Democratic Alliance. Lots going on just a day after the writ of election was issued. So let's get Deputy Political Editor Royston Sim in on this discussion. Roy, eight new PAP candidates were unveiled earlier today. What do you make of the first two batches? A good mix, perhaps? And thanks, Olivia. So, yes, the PAP unveiled um, the first eight of 26 candidates today. And in introducing them, Deputy Prime Minister Heng Sui Kiet described them as an interesting and uh, diverse slate. And I think that's quite, a, quite an apt description. Uh, of the eight, um, three are from the public service and the other five are from the private sector. So um, of the three, uh, two have backgrounds, or, or should I say, two are come from what you would con traditionally consider the PAP's usual hunting grounds when it comes to new candidates. Uh, one of them, Desmond Tan, is a former Brigadier General with the Singapore Armed Forces and he was the Chief Executive Director of the People's Association for about three years uh, and he's, uh, you know, some observers have tipped him for higher office um, assuming he gets elected. Uh, the second one is Yip Hon Wing who is the Group Chief of uh, the Silver Generation Office, also a senior civil servant and uh, Fami Aliman used to be a Colonel in the SAF and he was the Deputy Chief Executive of MUIS before now joining the NTUC. So um, these are, I suppose, um, candidates that you would, have, are tr would fit in the more traditional sort of PAP mould. Uh, but from the private sector, um, you have Edward Chia, who is the co-founder and managing director of Timber. Uh, and I think he's um, more out of the box, would you say, because uh, I think the PAP traditionally has not managed to attract as many uh, entrepreneurs. Or, or they, have, they have gotten people from the private sector. So out of the five or two are lawyers, uh, Haini So and also uh, Nadia Samdin. But they too have uh, sort of more um, unusual backgrounds. I mean, Nadia started uh, volunteering from 15 and uh, Haini uh, was from normal academic and then rose through the polytechnics and before she became a lawyer. So more unconventional sort of educational path. And that goes the same for Don Wee, uh, who was also in the polytechnic, you know, before he joined UOB as a banker. Mm -hmm. So of the first eight, interesting slate uh, and, and, you know, look forward to seeing uh, the rest of their new candidates and new faces.
Mm. Um, Roy, let's move on to the big news from this morning. Mr. Lee Sen Yang seen with uh, Dr. Tan Cheng Bok and the PSP at Tiong Bahru Market. Now, both men were equally coy about the Prime Minister's brother running in this general election. What are the chances of that happening, you think? Um, well, I feel that uh, you're right, both men were coy. I mean, Lee Hsien Yang, when he uh, was interviewed, you know, said that uh, you know, when he's ready to disclose it, he would let the media know. Uh, and Dr. Tan Cheng Bong basically said, you know, they, uh, in politics, timing is everything, and you know, he would likewise reveal it closer to the date. But what we hear from party sources is that Mr. Lee is unlikely to stand as a candidate. Um, so he would be involved, you know, in helping the party campaign and, and uh, you know, be involved in the hustings. But he's at least what we're hearing at this time is that he's unlikely to stand. Right. Well, the PSP chose to reveal Mr. Lee's membership in Tanjong Paga GRC, um, which is, of course, the former stronghold of the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. It's also one of the nine constituencies the PSP will be contesting. So, Roy, what is the message uh, that the party is trying to send? Well, I think it's, it's symbolic, the fact that they are unveiling uh, Mr. Lee Sien Yang and announcing he's joining an, an opposition party in what was his father's um, stronghold. Mm -hmm. you know, I think it's, they're trying to send a message that uh, you know, the, the PAP uh, under the current leadership has sort of uh, lost its way and you know, that is why even though he is uh, you know, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's son, he has chosen to band with the opposition uh, you know, in, in sort of uh, protest of the direction in which they are headed. But I, I feel that the message, uh, you know, that they wanted to send uh, would have been stronger if, you know, he had announced his candidacy and that he was going to be fielded as a candidate. So, uh, but still, I'm, I'm sure they chose the location of, uh, you know, Tiong Bahru Market within Tanjong Paga GRC um, quite carefully. Mm. Right. The PSP will likely be in a head-to-head -head fight with the PAP in a West Coast GRC after the Reform Party withdrew its interest in contesting there. Now, the PAP defeated RP in 2015 and 2011. What are the PSP's chances of winning West Coast? Well, I think it's uh, certainly better than if uh, the Reform Party had contested and they had to you know, take part in a three-cornered fight, which most likely would have been to the incumbent PAP's advantage. But nonetheless, I think they will still face, uh, 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 it won't be easy for them, because although Doc Dr. Tan Cheng Bok was an incumbent MP uh, for 26 years uh, in, with the PAP, his in Ayo Raja, that it was a single seat, you know, which is now part of a larger GRC, and it's a lot harder to, uh, you know, capture a GRC. And also, in the time that since he left politics, which is about, um, I think, almost 14 years now, uh, quite a lot has changed. You know, the landscape has changed, the demographics would have changed, and so it's no longer the same ward that he's contesting. So, I mean, I think their chances have improved because they are no longer going to be embroiled in a three cornered fight, but um, it will still be a challenge. Right. Well, thank you for your time, Roy. That was Royston Sim, Deputy Political Editor at The Straits Times. And you can head to our GE 2020 microsite for all the news leading up to polling day on July the 10th. Now, moving on from debating on whether this is the right time to call for an election to safety concerns arising from holding one amid the COVID-19 pandemic, multimedia journalist Rene Po hit the streets to find out what Singaporeans think about the timing of the upcoming election. Singaporeans will go to the polls on July 10th after Parliament was dissolved yesterday and a general election was called. This election is set to be a very different one amid the COVID-19 outbreak. I'm here today in Bishan to find out what Singaporeans think of having the election now, as well as what their concerns are. Because phase two, majority of the businesses uh, are being uh, resumed. So to me, election during phase two should be quite okay because I'm sure government have uh, 
have the safety entry for, for Singaporeans. Uh. I think it's acceptable because it's kind of like a, if not now, when? You have to follow SOP. Lah. You know, so they just see all this. Uh, they want the most important uh, in order to, to I call the, to avoid any danger for the COVID-19. You know? um, personally, feel it would be better if you can uh, hold it when the when the the the, the COVID-19 dies down lah. But I, I guess right now it's also not too bad because it's already over the. I mean, phase one is over. Then now start phase two. And I think it's stabilised already. Earlier, the Elections Department announced that physical rallies will give way to virtual ones and political parties will be given extra television airtime. I feel it's better eh, because you can watch online. <laughs> yeah, so if you can watch online, everybody have a fair chance to watch every rally. Yeah, then you don't have... Because when, if you are physical at one place, right, you cannot go to the other venue. So right now you can see all the rallies at your own pace. Lah. I think that being in person and being able to like preach and to uh, say what uh, you feel to the public in person is better, it's more sincere. We are fine with it because uh, understanding that uh, during this COVID, a lot of things are also online. Right. So I believe Singaporeans, they already get used to the online services of this. So it's not an issue. Yeah. Safety measure also play a part. I think we're still in the COVID-19. I think uh, we have to do our part also to keep safe for everyone. Though this election will be very different, Singaporeans are generally assured of their safety by the measures put in place. But with the long-term impact of the virus, it remains to be seen whether candidates will be able to address the concerns of voters. Renee Po for The Straits Times. So come July the 10th, more than 2.65 million voters will head to the polls. Here's a look at what you can, what you have to do that day with the safe distancing measures in place. On to the latest COVID-19 figures in Singapore, the Health Ministry confirmed 191 new coronavirus cases today. They include seven community cases, now two are Singaporeans or permanent residents, and five are work pass holders. Migrant workers living in dormitories make up the vast majority of the other cases. Singapore's total cases is now over 42,600 and more details will be released later. 
contactless kiosks that allow users to take their own temperatures within two seconds will be rolled out at 70 bus interchanges and MRT stations. They are part of an SG United initiative to encourage people to monitor their temperature regularly. The machines have been deployed at five locations, Bradle, Boon King and Tiong Bahru MRT stations and Bukit Panjang and Serangoon bus interchanges. They will be available at all 70 locations by the next quarter and will be there for up to a year. Dengue cases have hit a new high here with about 200 new cases a day. The number of weekly new cases has also exceeded all-time peaks of two, for two consecutive weeks. There were 1,377 infections last week and 1,154 the previous week, which was the first time weekly cases crossed the 1,000 mark in Singapore's history. At least 12 people between 56 and 80 years old have died from dengue this year. The Ministry of Manpower said today that there will be four long weekends next year, three fewer than this year. Of the 11 annual public holidays next year, three fall on Friday and one on Monday. The Friday holidays are New Year's Day on January 1st, Chinese New Year on February 12th and Good Friday on April 2nd. The August 9th National Day holiday falls on a Monday. Now, Law and Home Affairs Minister K. Shanmugam told The Straits Times yesterday that Singapore political parties should focus on matters of economy and health care in the general election. He added that the government will be stepping up its cybersecurity for the election, cautioning Singaporeans to do the same. Since the circuit breaker, the number of people falling for online scams has increased. Mr. Shamugam also answered questions on race, saying that Singapore's approach to managing societal fault lines among different groups is not like other countries, referencing the Black Lives Matter movement in the US. Here are the highlights from his interview with Assistant Political Editor Lim Yan Liang. In times of great economic strain, or the situation like COVID across the world, it causes uh, emotional strain, mental strain, social strain, and of course, tremendous economic strain. These kinds of stresses damage society. It also brings out the latent tensions, uh, sometimes not low, so latent tensions. So if you see in the US, you have got protest, uh, you know, a police officer, uh, an African-American is killed in the process of uh, arrest. The Video is very emotive, and when you look at it, people will get angry. Within our own context, we have tried to do things very differently from the US. But I will say, for example, if you take the month of April, we have had far more interracial incidents than we have had for some years. So the stresses are still there, but when we say far more, it's a very, very different quantum compared with other countries. We have gun control. You, don't, you can't have a gun to go around shooting people. We handle race relations in a very different way. We integrate our societies. We don't allow ghettos to develop. We provide opportunities across all races. It doesn't mean there is no racism. I repeatedly said there is racism in every society. It's just a question of how much racism. But ours is not institutionalized. What is happening elsewhere is a warning to us as to what can happen here if we are not careful. It's the same thing with protests. Some people ask me, oh, you know, you don't allow protests, which is strictly speaking not true. I mean, we do allow them, but in a specified place. If you want to do it elsewhere, you need to apply for permits. And the philosophy is very simple. When you want to protest elsewhere, say Orchard Road, essentially you want to cause uh, some degree of disseminity to other people. Why should you be allowed to? shopkeepers, pedestrians, others, you know, roads get blocked. That's what happens in other countries. Your right to protest should be weighed against other people's right to carry on with their lives as they wish. And Can you give us an update on the law and order situation now that Singapore has exited the circuit breaker? During the circuit breaker, obviously some crimes went down. I mean, house breaking because everybody is at home. So not so easy to do molest on public transport because people were not taking public transport. Uh, these sorts of crimes went down substantially. 
uh, at the same time, the online scams went up and we have to try and teach people to be much more uh, savvy about it because there is a limited amount the police can do, particularly if the scammers are overseas and it's done online. Uh, sex for money scams, you know, people fall for this all the time. Uh, also, quite disturbingly, the level of family violence has gone up, I think, 27 to 30 percent. Uh, and that uh, was worrying. And uh, we put in place some more proactive measures. The law is tough. The law remains the same, but some additional measures, like, for example, if there is a report by someone who claims to be a victim, then there would be immediate follow-up on the social side to see whether the social services people need to go and give support, uh, try and protect the, you know, the alleged victim or whoever has filed the report. So, you know, you react according to the situation. Now, most people are out, as in going back to work, though work from home remains a default position. And uh, we have to step up uh, the uh, vigilance on the kind of crimes that take place when people come out. MHA and ELD have both uh, released advisories recently about both uh, foreign interference in light of the coming election and cyber threats. What are some recent uh, instances or examples that come to your mind and how concerned should we be? The internet has made foreign interference from a variety of sources, governments as well as private sector, much easier. Uh, and foreign countries using their agencies can come in very many deceptive ways and intervene. And it's easy to do by a lot of people. It'll be foolish of us not to take steps to deal with it. So I think cultivating our politicians is one thing. Interfering through our politicians or through the media or through local NGOs, that's a classic method. That, I think, is something that people always try and we keep a lookout. And then with the internet, it is turbocharged to this kind of interference through fake news, through lies, through a variety of uh, disinformation campaigns, through hacking. Many things happen. And you really got to be on top of the game. But uh, we have some resources and uh, we have been looking at uh, how these things might happen. I'm not going to say we're going to be able to catch everything. But uh, being aware of the risk is quite a lot of the problem solved. Having some technical capability and waiting and, you know, planning it is also important. We have also given advisories to all the political parties to be aware, to try and take uh, some safeguards on their own websites uh, so that they, you know, they try and prevent themselves from being hacked. From your constituency outreach, what do you see as the main issues that uh, voters are thinking over as they go to the polls? Has uh, COVID brought some things to the fore? Has certain things receded into the back? I think what's uppermost for voters now, right now, are really two issues. The healthcare situation and the economy, their jobs, their jobs, their children's jobs. These are the two things, healthcare and economy. These are serious issues. And I think it behoves uh, the politicians to really focus on this and deal with these issues during the elections, because people want to know what's going to happen with the COVID situation and what is your solution on the economy? What does it mean in six months? What does it mean in a year? What does it mean in five years? South Korea now has said it's in the middle of a second wave. So this happens, the, this virus is a very clever enemy and overall the numbers have come down. But when we open up, we fully expect that the number of community cases will go up. Our Thinking is we'll need to manage it in a way where our healthcare capacity does not get overwhelmed and we are on top of the situation because we can't also keep uh, ourselves shut down. Jobs will go, the economy will go. And at the same time, we have put in four budgets, we have helped people and people want to know, yes, that's so, but you know that alone doesn't allow the companies to survive. They do need to do business and business environment continues to be tough. Who can take them through this period? Who can make sure the companies survive? Who can make sure their jobs continue? These are critical questions for them. And I think this is where our focus has been 
ever since COVID started, all of us, you know, totally focused on this. And uh, I think during the campaign, that is what voters will want to hear about. You just heard Law and Home Affairs Minister K. Shamugam. Now you can watch his full interview with The Straits Times on our YouTube channel. In the global headlines, the director of the U.S.'s Centers for Disease Control and Prevention told a Congress hearing that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought the U.S. to its knees. Dr. Robert Redfield said that core public health capabilities had been vastly underfunded for a long time and needed urgent investment, adding that the next few weeks will be critical in quelling COVID-19 hotspots around the country. Dr. Redfield said the U.S. will probably spend $7 trillion because of one little virus. To date, the U.S. has more than 2.3 million cases and over 121,000 coronavirus-related deaths. In Chennai, the capital of India's southern state of Tamil Nadu is going into a second lockdown in the hope of quelling a spike of 2,700 COVID-19 cases per day. Tamil Nadu has the third highest number of cases in India and almost 70% of those are in Chennai alone. Chennai also accounts for 80% of COVID-19 deaths. The 12-day lockdown will leave only pharmacies and hospitals open and all vehicles will be banned on the road except for medical and relief work. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has announced that pubs, restaurants and hotels could reopen in England early next month. From July 4th, other businesses such as hairdressers, places of worship, most leisure facilities and tourist attractions, including theme parks, will be allowed to open. However, nightclubs and indoor gyms will stay closed. The UK's chief medical advisor, Patrick Valance, warned the British public, don't be fooled, this means coronavirus has gone away. At the same time, health leaders published a letter in the British Medical Journal asking if the UK is properly prepared for the real risk of a second wave. The UK currently sees around 4,300 daily COVID-19 infections with around 130 deaths a day. As Singapore settles into phase two of reopening, life will still not revert to what it used to be. So to inspire and uplift readers in this new normal, The Straits Times commissioned 30 works by local writers and artists on the COVID-19 pandemic and what it will be like when all this is over. This was done with the support of the National Arts Council as part of the hashtag SG Culture Anywhere campaign. Last week, we featured the song Autumn by the Seongling Musical Association. Today, we have Baskers Arts Academy with their performance titled Prati Sandi. Now, this piece was inspired by the classic Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Have a look. <laughs> We're now joined by Mrs. Santa Basca, who came up with the performance Prati Sandi or Reunion. Now, she's the Artistic Director of Multidisciplinary Performing Arts Group, Basca's Arts Academy, and also a Cultural Med Medallion recipient. Mrs. Basca, thank you for joining us. Now, for a start, tell us more about your performance at Prati Sandi. Hi, good evening. Uh, Prati Sandi is a reunion of my dance and self. Uh, actually, COVID-19 spoke to me. I scatter misery and fear all around. I am the hell's mad ugly, ugly ocean. This causes sleepless night and Pradesanti creation started. Thinking of music composition and relevant to the dance pieces, 
I have to present this digitally. A poem narrated connecting the dances, which may help audience to understand my dance. There are four dancers and four musicians, and music, music is all traditional compositions, and dance is also traditional Bharatanatyam style of dance. It is difficult to explain dance rather than dance need to be experienced. So I want everybody to watch it and experience the dance. Not I do not want you to speak so much about it. There are no words I can explain dance. Mrs. Bosco, what was uh, the biggest challenge uh, that you had to face while coming up uh, with this performance? Uh, it was uh, time. There was not enough time. Mm -hmm. So when a seed is dropped into my mind, I need time to spend to give love and positive vibes so that the seed can grow into a plant which will bear fruits, beautiful flowers. But this was an instant plant planted with a safe distancing and checked whether they're healthy. Was a challenge and a warning for, for the future of my dance. Mm. Mm. What is the message you hope to put across to your audience through your performance? Be detached. Be brave, like a warrior with valor. Possibilities are infinite. You need to tap them. Challenge for the future. I quote Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, verse 38. Fight for the sake of duty, treating alike happiness and distress, loss and gain, victory and defeat. Fulfill your responsibility in this way. I think that is the message that I want the readers and audience to know about it, about this production called Pradisandhi, Reunion of Self. Well said, uh, Mrs. Baska. Thank you so much for spending time to speak with us. We were speaking to Mrs. Santa Baska, the Artistic Director of Multidisciplinary Performing Arts Group, Baska's Arts Academy. The group produced the piece Prati Sunday as part of the 30 Days of Art with NAC series. And you can find more information on the series and see the other works at this Straits Times website. Before we go, just a reminder, you can also bookmark our GE 2020 microsite to follow our live blog and get all the latest election news. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Harianto Diman with Olivia Kuei. See you again tomorrow on The Big Story.